Humanity, an Introduction to Cultural Anthropology by James Peoples and Garrick Bailey. Chapter three, Culture and Language. As part of intercultural, children socially learn one or more languages of their speech community. Language consists of the shared knowledge of sounds, words, meanings, and grammatical rules that people use to send and receive complex messages. Along with our depend <clears throat> dependence on culture, humanity's ability to communicate complex, precise information is the main mental cap capability that distinguishes humans from other animals. Language and humanity. Although we talk or to or text people daily, we seldom consider how remarkable it is that we are able to do so. As with culture, we take language for granted and most of us do not realize how unusual our communication skills are. If you were a fish, would you know how well your body is adapted to moving through water? The ability to speak, write, and comprehend the messages of languages requires knowledge of an enormous number of linguistic units, sounds, words, and rules for combining them, grammar, language, and culture together are critical to the development of human individuals. Without them, our psychological and social development is incomplete. In all probability, without them, we would be unable to think as the word think is generally understood. The thinking process itself depends critically on the knowledge of some language. In fact, some scholars suggest that knowledge and the use of a particular language conditions are minds to perceive nature and people in particular ways, thus shaping how we think about the world and the things in it. Not only is Homo sapiens the only animal capable of speech, but we also are the only animal biologically evolved to speak and understand true language. Other animals certainly communicate. Male birds sing and sing to announce territories and attract mates, as do other animals like frogs and toads. Worker honeybees returning to the hive dance to tell hive mates the direction, distance, and quality of food source. Other species of social insects like ants and termites have similar capabilities. Elephants, some whales, and dolphins, gorillas, bonobos, and chimpanzees likewise perform impressive feats of communication. However, only humans have language in its fully developed form. To understand the meaning of fully developed, compare language to the communicative abilities man's, chimpanzees, and gorillas have learned to use sign language or to manipulate stand symbols standing for words and concepts into sentences. With no interference, one chimp taught sign language to another, and later they used it to communicate to, with one another. Despite these feats, great, no great ape is capable of answering this simple question. What are your plans for the next week? Language shaped humanity's biological evolution. Most obviously, this includes the cheap I'm sorry, the speech regions of our brain. It also includes our vocal tract. The human vocal tract consists of lungs, trachea, including the vocal cords, as well as the windpipe, <clears throat> mouth, and nasal passages. The local tract is biologically evolved for speech. The human mouth is remarkable resonating chamber. Here are a few examples. You make different vowel sounds by raising and lowering the tongue or parts of the tongue. Changing the position of the tongue modifies the shape of the mouth and produces sounds of different wavelengths that human ears recognize as different sounds. For example, compare where your tongue is for the vowel sounds as you say these words, sit and set, far and fur, did and dad, teeth and tooth, lass and loss. Likewise, you pronounce 
most consonants sounds by interrupting the flow of air through the mouth. This initial sound of the word tip is formed by bringing the tip of your tongue into contact with the alveolar ridge just behind the teeth <clears throat> and then releasing the contact sun suddenly. You can change tip and si to sip by blowing air through your mouth while almost but not quite touching the tip of your tongue to your av alveolar ridge, thus making the initial sound a brief hissing noise. Try it and see for yourself. Your vocal cords interact with your mouth to make distinct sounds. Either they vibrate and produce a buzzy sound as an mm, or they remain open to allow airflow, allow air to flow into your mouth freely, as in in the first sound H in how. Your change, or you change tip to dip by vibrating your vocal cords with the first sound of the word dip, articulating various parts of the vocal tract in contrasting ways, make other vowels and consonants of English and other languages. You move all these parts of your vocal tract unconsciously with the astounding speed and precision. Each sound is possible because the vocal chamber formed by the mouth, throat, nasal passages and the muscles of the tongue and lips are biologically evolved for this purpose. There is a good reason chimpanzees cannot speak human words. Their local vocal, <clears throat> their vocal tract is not evolved to do so yet. The, with training, any human child can utter the sounds found in any language. <clears throat> language allows people to communicate about concrete persons, places, things, actions, and events. It allows communication and thought about abstract concepts as well. Among such abstractions are truth, evil, God, masculinity, values, humanity, zero, law, jihad, universal democracy, ethnicity, space, culture, and hatred. Humans all understand such abstractions. Indeed, without the ability to conceptualize such abstractions, culture as we experience, it could not exist. Furthermore, our everyday behavior is greatly affected by contrasts that are abstract, such as friend and enemy, <clears throat> beautiful and ugly, play and work, Social learning by which children acquire culture would be impossible without language. Because people share language, <clears throat> much of the knowledge in one person's mind can be transmitted into the mind of another person. <clears throat> Excuse me. During enculturation, not only do we learn facts and lessons about the world, but we also hear stories and myths communicating messages that are often implicit and unstated. These stories, myths, and other narratives become part of our identity, shape our relationships with other people, to, and help formulate the cultural constructions and worldviews of a people. The power of language. All languages have properties that allow novel, <clears throat> and complex messages to be communicated quickly, precisely, and in several mediums. This is possible even if the people or events under discussion are far away in space or time. In 1960, linguist Charles Hockett identified 13 properties that, are, that distinguish language from the communication abilities of other animals. Five of Hockett's properties are especially important to demonstrate the power of language. Discreteness. Discreteness means that while speaking, people combine units, sounds, and words according to conventional rules. Knowing a language means knowing both the units and the rules for combining them. Words are composed of discrete units of sound, e.g. J, U, M, P that are combined to communicate a meaning jump, 
Similarly, we applied rules to combine units of meanings words to form sentences. Discrete sounds are the essential units. Metaphorically, they are the building blocks of language. Discreteness makes alphabets possible. In alphabetic writing, people combine the letters of, the, of their alphabet to form printed words. Originally, each sound of the English alphabet was pronounced in a similar way in all the words in which it appeared. For example, the letter sound T appears in student textbook Eat and Today. In English writing, most letters no longer represent a single sound. The letter A, for example, is pronounced differently in the words act, father, warden, assume, and nature. Some single sounds in English are rendered in two letters, such as th and g and the gh in rough and ghoul. Why doesn't each English spelling always reflect the way words are pronounced? One reason is that since the widespread of using <clears throat> widespread use of the printing press, changes in the English pronunciation have occurred faster than changes in spelling. By themselves, most sounds carry no meaning. The three sounds in cat, for example, carry meaning only when <clears throat> strung together. When combined differently, they mean act and tack. Words then are, are composed of sound combination that a speech community recognizes as the conveying standardized meanings. Not all combinations of sounds are possible in a given language. For instance, in English, MP, NT, and ID, I think it's LD, I'm sorry, are all possible combinations, but PM, TN, and DL are not, although these combinations are used by other languages. Productivity. Just as all languages use <clears throat> a small number of sounds to make a larger number of words, so speakers string words together according to grammatical rules to convey the messages carried by sentences. By mastering their language's words and meanings and the rules for combining words into sentences, speakers can send and Listeners can understand messages of great complexity with amazing precision, e.g. from that basket of beefsteak tomatoes, give me the reddest one. Productivity derives from this ability to put words together to create new sentences to communicate messages. It refers to a speaker's ability to create totally novel sentences and to a listener's ability to comprehend them. Productivity means that a language's finite number of words can be combined into an infinite number of meaningful sentences. The sentences are meaningful because the speaker and listener know what each word means individually and the rules by which the words may be combined to convey messages. Although people routinely apply them each time they speak and hear, most are not consciously aware of their knowledge of these rules. Unless you have linguistic training, you probably do not know that you form an English plural by adding one to, of two sounds, either Z or S, to the end of a noun. For example, contrast this last sounds of beans and beets, or cobs and cots. Arbitrariness. The relationship between the sound combinations that make up words and the meanings of meanings these words com communicate is arbitrary. The words and combinations of words, sentences, are symbols. See chapter two. Children learn to match certain sound com combinations with their meanings. By the age of one or two years, most children have learned the meanings of dozens of words. They have mastered the words that refer to objects, ball, animals, doggy, people, mama, sensory experiences, hot, qualities, blue, hard, actions, eat, run, commands, no, come here, 
emotions, love, and so forth. The child learns to associate these meanings with words, even though the specific <clears throat> sound combinations that convey these various meanings have no inherent relationship to the things themselves. Because of the arbitrary relationship between the meanings and words, our ability to communicate ling linguistic messages is based on shared conventions. As symbols, words can carry factual meanings, look at trees, or meanings that are charged with emotion, save the trees. Displacement. Displacement refers to our ability to talk about objects, people, places, things, and events that are remote in time and space because language uses symbols, words, and sentences to transmit meanings. Objects and people do not have to be immediately visible for us to communicate about them. We can discuss someone who is out of sight because of the symbols <clears throat> of language, in this case, a name. Call that a person to mind, allowing us to think about him or her. <clears throat> we can speculate about the future because although its events may never happen, our language has symbols that stand for future time and more symbols that allow us to form a mental image of possible events. We can learn about events that happened before we were born, such as wars in Vietnam, Iraq, and Syria. People can learn of events and things far away in space, such as fighting in Afghanistan, factories in China and India, tsunamis in Japan, mass homicides in Colorado and Connecticut, and nuclear threats from North Korea. The displacement property also makes it possible to describe things like ghosts, zombies, and places like the Shire and Winterfell that do not even exist. We can share stories about events that might not even have really happened and thus create, create myths, fiction, legends, fairy tales, and folklore. Political leaders can mislead citizens and be misled themselves about weapons of mass destru destruction and terrorist connections in distant lands. Much that is familiar in human life depends on this important property, including the ability to lie. Here is the concept review. I'm going to go ahead because the next session goes on to the next page. Multimedia potential. Another important property of language is multimedia potential, meaning that linguistic messages can be transmitted through a variety of media. When you speak, that the medium for your message is speech transmitted to the ears of your listeners by sound waves. Writing is the medium in which the messages of, the, of this book are transmitted. When you text relatives and friends, software converts the letters on your phone's keypad in a digital form that is tr transmitted into, in cyberspace into letters they can read and understand. Gestures and body movements are communications media that are received by the sense of sight rather than hearing. And hand and finger gestures are media for the hearing impaired. As illustrated by American Sign Language, even touching and the resulting nerve signals can be media for language. Helen Keller, both blind and deaf, communicated and received linguistic messages by touch. Of course, speech was the original medium for language beginning about 5,000 years ago. The ancient Sumerians of Middle East developed writing. Egyptians developed their hieroglyphic system shortly afterward. Chinese writing grew out of symbols incised into cattle scapula and the hard underside of tortoises. The ancient Mesoamerican peoples known as the Zapotecs and Maya carved meaningful symbols into stone pillars and walls, now recognized as yet another independent origin of writing.
This means that Mesopotamians, Chinese and Mesopotamian peoples did not learn to write from other people, but invented their own writing system. In various ancient civilizations, writing was used to keep records of taxes, labor, oracles, the passage of time, calendars, and military conquests over several centuries. Writing techniques spread to other regions such as the Greek islands, South Asia, Korea, Japan, and Western Europe. We take writing so much for granted that it hard to imagine life without books and magazines, computers and the internet, street signs and billboards, cell phones and texting. Although obvious when stated, few people today think about how writing makes modern life possible. The concept review summarizes these five key properties of language. Together, discreteness, productivity, arbitrariness, displacement, and multimedia potential make language the most precise and complete system of communication known among living things. If these properties seem obvious, fancy words for what everyone knows, that is because as human beings, we rarely think about what it is that makes our species special. In brief, language is powerful to make it is powerful. It makes abstract thought possible. It allows the fast and precise transmission of information from one individual and gener generation to another. It makes possible to speculate about events that could possibly happen tomorrow. If another set of events should happen to occur, we can learn about events that happened far away and long ago, and events that didn't happen at all. Language allows us to text, I love you, even when we don't mean it, to write and read fictional stories and novels, and to understand myths and legends. All these things are human, and to do things humans do so routinely, that we consider them ordinary, and they are far or for humanity. How language works. When children learn language, they master an, an, an enormous amount of information. Grammar refers to all the knowledge shared by those who speak and understand a language. The sounds of the language, rules for combining sounds into sequences, meanings conveyed, by, oh, I'm sorry, by those sequences and how sentences are constructed by stringing words together according to precise rules. Grammatical knowledge is unconscious. Those who share langu a language cannot verbalize the knowledge that allows them to communicate with one another. It also is intuitive. Speaking and understanding are automatic. We ordinarily do not see, need to think about how to speak or understand linguistic messages. The scientific use of the term grammar differs from the everyday understanding of the word in everyday speech. Some people judge those judge others partly on the basis of whether others use proper grammar. In the English language, <clears throat> and most others spoken by large numbers of people, there are several dialects or variations in speech patterns, including in pronunciation and vocabulary. Dialects may be ba based on factors like region, e.g. England, Wales, the American South, Australia, Jamaica, or ethnic identification, e.g. Louisiana Creole, Black English, Spanglish, but speakers of English all understand one another. Although sometimes with difficulty in the United States, one American dialect called Standard American English, SAE, and it is a dialect that one common in the national news media is culturally accepted as most proper. Some of those, some of those whose dialect is SAE look down on those with other dialects, often based on differences in class, race, or educational levels. Members of various ethnic race, racial categories often have their own ways of pronunciation, pronouncing, oh my goodness gracious, 
pr pronouncing words or styles of speaking. Children learn dialects based on ethnic identity at a young age from family and friends, but there may be more to speaking a dialect than simply speaking the way you learned while growing up. In Canada and the United States, many <clears throat> African and Hispanic Americans adopt a speech style as a symbol of pride in their identity. To show they are cool, some young whites adopt phrases they hear from the media or from persons with African or Hispanic heritages. In Hawaii, some Aheolis use the word bruda to address native Hawaiian males, thus trying to show they are in touch. Notice that there is no such thing as a superior and inferior dialect or language in the linguistic sense. That is, each language and each dialect is equally capable of serving as a vehicle for communication, communicating the messages its speakers need to send and receive. So long as a person successfully communicates, there is no such thing as bad grammar or people who don't know proper grammar. If Jennifer says, I ain't got no shoes, you will have a different impression of her than if she says, I have no shoes. But the first Jennifer's speech is perfectly good English to member of certain subcultures who speak one English dialect. If speakers communicate their intended meaning to listeners, then the words they use or the ways they construct their sentences are as valid, valid linguistically as any other. The evaluations we make of someone else's grammar or overall style of speech then are cultural evaluations. They are based on some people's cultural beliefs of correct grammar, conceptions about the kinds of people who speak in certain way, and so forth. Education systems try to in inculcate students in the dialect that is broadly accepted <clears throat> as correct, but it is a dialect. With this point about the equality of languages and dialects in mind, here are briefly here we briefly cover two aspects of grammar, sounds and their patterning and sounds combination words and their meanings. Sound systems. When we speak our vocal, excuse me, when we speak, our vocal tract emits a string of sounds that sounds of a language together with the way these sounds occur in irregular and consistent patterns make up the phonological system of the language. The study of the sound system is called phonolo phonology. The particular sounds that speakers of a language recognize as distinct from other sounds are called phonemes. Phonemes are individual sounds that make a difference in the meaning of words. Linguists use slash marks, hashtags, to show that a particular sound is a, phon a phoneme in a given language. Thus, a few en English consonants are F, T, B, N, Z, and L. Some English vowels are A, I, pronounced E, O, and U. Thus, con words consist of a string of phonemes like me and you. Although there is an O in the way you spell you, phonologically, the O is absence. Of course, languages <clears throat> have different phon phonemes and the phonemes of some do not appear in others. If you know Spanish, then you know that V does not exist in the language, which is why narratives, narrative speakers of Spanish may pronounce very as Barry. English has no L or R sound, which is why Japanese people have trouble distinguishing 
them when they speak English. On the other hand, the Japanese language distinguishes sounds that English does not. Japanese use double consonant sounds that make a difference in the meanings of words like T versus TT or P versus PP. Thus using English spelling, kite means come and kite or yeah, kite means stamp which is one reason Japanese can be very hard for many foreigners to pronounce correctly. Other languages, including Korean, also double up consonants <clears throat> to make different words. Furthermore, differences that one language recognizes in sounds are not always recognized in other languages. English speakers hear differences between consonants that are voiced your vocal cords vibrate to make buzzy a buzzy sound, as in B, and voiceless, your vocal cords do not vibrate, as in F, thus in English. Bat and fat are different words, as are bat and pat. <clears throat> but in, a, in Korean, a language of Micronesia, the sound differences between B and F, D and T, B and P, and G and K, make no difference in meaning it is if it is as if english speakers could not distinguish between veal and feel between dan and tan between big and pig and between got and caught in english other consonants is voiced or voiceless makes a difference in the meanings of words in which they occur in course corsarian it does not one of the most interesting ways language differ in phonology is in how they use pitch of the voice to convey meaning. The pitch of a voice depends on how fast the vocal cords vibrate. The higher the frequency of vibration, the higher the pitch of the voice. English speakers use pitch to convey different meanings. As you can set contrasting the following sentences. She's going home. She's going home. The first statement is turned into a question by alterating, altering the pitch of the voice. In the question, the pitch raises the word with the word home. Speakers of English use pitch changes over the whole sentence to communicate a different message. Communicate a message. That is, the voice pitch falls and... <clears throat> or rises between words rather than within a word. There are many other languages in which high, medium, or low pitch used within individual word, or even in a syllable changes the fundamental meaning of the word. When the pitch or tone with which a word is said or a change in the voice pitch during its pronunciation affects the meaning of a word the language is known as a tone language. Tone language is, is are widespread in Africa and in Southeastern and Eastern Asia, Chinese, Thai, Burmese, and Vietnamese. All are, are all tone languages. Japanese and Korean are not, which is one more reason most Canadians, French, and Germans have trouble mastering these languages. As an example, of how pitch can affect meaning, consider these words from Nupi, an African tone language. B, okay. Ba, a high tone, to be sour. Be, medium tone, to cut. Ba, low tone, to count. Here, whether ba is pronounced, whether a high, mid, or low tone changes, its meaning because the tone with which a word is pronounced changes its meaning. The pitch of the voice is kind of a phoneme in tone languages. It has the same effect as adding S in front of the English word pot, which alters the word to spot. Words and meanings. Words are combinations of phonemes to which people attach 
conventional meanings, any language contains a finite number of words, each matched to one or more meaning. I'm gonna go ahead and there's a couple of grammar things so that you can, for vocabulary words. And then here is the other one. Morphology is the study of the of meaningful sound sequences and the rules by which they are formed. Any sequence of phenom phonemes that carries meaning is known as a morpheme. Why not just call them words? Because in analyzing meanings, morphologists need a more precise concept than word. For example, you know the meaning of the following sounds sequences, none of which is itself a word. UN, PRE, NON, anti, ED, S, ING, and IST. Both are the prefixes in the first column and the suffixes in the second alter the meaning of certain other morphemes when they are attached to them. Sound sequences like these are detachable from particular words. For instance, adding the suffix IST to art and novel creates new meanings, a person who creates art and one who writes novels. That I IST has a similar meaning whenever it has a suffix is shown by the made up word CRM by adding IST you, to it, you instantly know that criminus, crimist is, the pronounce, is a person who crims. To analyze such compound words and their meanings, linguists have a, con a concept that include prefixes and suffixes such as UNI, ING, and LY. There are two kinds of morphemes in all languages. A free morpheme is any morpheme who, that can stand alone as a word. For example, desire, possible, health, complete, anthropology, and establish. A bound morpheme is attached to free morpheme to modify the meaning in predictable ways. For example, dis, by, un, er, ly, and ed. Thus, by adding bound morphemes to the free morphemes. In our example, we get the following. Desires, possible, desirable, impossible, undesirable, impossibility. Healthy, healthful, unhealthy, completed, incomplete, uncompleted, establishing, establishment, anti-establishment, anthropologist, anthropologically, non-anthropologist. Just as phonemes are a language's minimal units of sound, morphemes are the minimal units of meanings. Thus, we cannot break down the free morphemes, friend, vocabulary, linguistic, and soccer into any smaller units that carry meaning and modern English. Nor can we break down the bound morphemes, non- I-S-H and T-R-I into smaller meaningful units. We make a new compound words by applying a rule of compound word form formation, not by learning each compound word separately. For instance, take the English rule for formal, plur formal a plural noun for a singular Noun, it is usually done by adding either the bound morpheme Z, as in beads, colors, and X, or S, as in lamps, stakes, and pots. All meaning more than one, children learn the rule for plural formation at an early age, but it takes them a while longer to learn the many exceptions. Adults think it's cute when children apply the morphological rules of English constantly to all words saying child's, man's, foot's, mouse's, and deer's. For plurals and using go goad, 
runned, bringed, or dude, to make a present tense verb into a past tense verb. But children are born with the mental capability to deduce rules of sound and word combinations from their speech community, so are merely applying the rules they have deduced from many other words of all linguistic elements, free morphemes are most easily transmissible across different languages. Speakers often do not know how much the, of their na native vocabulary is mutt-like rather than purebred. For example, English has taken lots of words that did not exist in its Germanic origins as the next section discusses. I'm gonna go ahead and focus on that real quick so you can write the vocabulary words. Excuse me, Germanic Romantics and Native English. When peoples who speak different languages come into contact, one or both groups often incorporate or borrow foreign words. Incorporation is especially likely to happen if one language's words have no counterparts in, other, in the other. As often the case for nouns and verbs, because of the spread of world trade and pop political systems during the last five centuries, English words have spread widely into other languages. Japanese and Korean have incorporated hundreds of English words, many from the realm of technology and commodities in France. The use of English words becomes such a hot political issue that the government outlawed the importation of further English words. However, English speakers did not become too proud of the spread of their words. The English language itself is a member of the Germanic subfamily of languages, along with Dutch, German, Norwegian, Icelandic, Swedish, Danish, and Afrikaans between two and 3,000 years ago. All these languages were single languages, which linguistics call Proto-Germanic. As Germanic people migrated to different regions, the Proto-Germanic languages diverged, become, became distinctive over centuries until the speaker, speakers of each could not understand the other. Separate languages then existed. Although English is a member of the Germanic subfamily, over the centuries, English adopted hundreds of words from the Romance languages, which include French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Romanian. These languages originated in Latin as the Roman Empire spread throughout much of Egypt, of Europe. People who spoke a Germanic or other local language incorporated words from their Roman overlords. Many of the, these words are cognates as English speakers who study a modern language Languages like Spanish and French re recognize. Far less recognized is the fact that early English colonists who settled in the Americas adopted many words from Native Americans, words that are now part of a American English. The earliest European settlers of Eastern North Af America came from the British Isles and France except from French-speaking Quebec and parts of California, Texas, and Southwest. Most citizens of Canada and the United States speak English as their native language, but few of us realize that the impact of the original native languages, those spoken by Native Americans on English vocabulary, many familiar word, English words, phrases, and places names are derived from one or another. Native American language. The early Spanish and Portuguese explorers surprised at how many of the plants and animals in the New World at North Amer and South America and the Caribbean were unknown to them. Few animals such as deer and wolves were enough like familiar European fauna that European words were applied to them. Others, however, had no European counterparts. Terms taken from North American Indian languages were adopted for many of these 
including cougar, caribou, moose, raccoons, chipmunk, opossum, skunk, woodchuck, and chigger. Other English terms for animals are taken from the languages of South American peoples, condor, piranha, tapir, toucan, jaguar, alpaca, viscuna, and llama. Plants, too, were unfamiliar and Native American words were adopted for saguaro, yucca, mesquite, persimmon, hickory, and pecan to name only some of the most common derivatives. As we discuss in chapter seven, Indians of the Americans were the first to domesticate numerous food plants that now have worldwide importance. All of the following crop names have Native American origins. Squash, maize, guava, hominy, avocado, tapioca, also called manioc and cassava, Cassava. Both words are also taken from the native languages. Papa, succotash, tomato, and potato. European immigrants also adopted Indian words for natural features other than plants and animals. Bayou, muskig, savannah, pompous, hurricane, and chinook. Terms in various native languages for clothing housing, and other material objects have made it into English, igloo, teepee, wigwam, moccasins, parka, poncho, toboggan, husky, canoe, kayak, and tomahawk, caucus, and pow powwow for mating. There are two other, Eng other English words with native origins. Those who smoke might be interested to learn that tobacco plant is from the New World as its name. People everywhere name geographic locations. The earliest European settlers often named American places to honor important people in their home countries. For example, Charleston, Albuquerque, Columbus, Carolina, and Virginia the latter named after their, after the condition of England's Queen Elizabeth I, other American place names are derived from European geography. Nova Scotia, New Scotland, New Hampshire, Maine, a province in France, and of course, New York, New Jersey, and New England. Native American peoples had their own names for places and landscape features, and often these names were the ones that endured and appear on current maps. River names with Indian origins include Mississippi, Ohio, Yukon, Missouri, Arkansas, Wabash, Potomac, Klamath, Minnesota, and Mohawk, to mention just a few of the most familiar. The lakes called Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Oneida, Tahoe, and Slave, pronounced Slave, have Indian names, as do hundreds of other bodies of waters, water in Canada and United States. Whole states are named after Indian peoples, such as Eleni, Massachusetts, UTE, Kansas, and Dakota, whereas names of other states and provinces are derived from native words such as Manitoba, Ontario, Sasquatchon, Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio, Minnesota, Iowa, and Nebraska. A few large city cities with names derived from Indian languages are Tuscaloosa, Tallahassee, Natchez, Tulsa, Cheyenne, Miami, Chicago, Saskatoon, Ottawa, and Omaha. Seattle was one name after a particular Indian leader called Sieff of the West Coast. Finally, the names of two whole countries in the North America continent have Native American roots. Kanata, which is Canada, is an Iroquoian meaning, word meaning village. Although it is now applied to a much larger community, the area of, <clears throat> formerly known as New Spain took the word 
the rulers of Aztec civilization used for themselves. Mexico, after winning its independence in 1823, in some many English words and places, place names have Native American origin. More generally, the languages people consider native to their region or country usually are a product of historical context and inter interactions. Our time perspectives, how far into the past we go when we think about language, are too short to recognize connections between our native tongue and other languages. Growth and the intensity in the intensity of economic globalization and global contacts in the last several decades have had a multitude of impacts on the world's languages and their survival, as discussed in the Global Challenges and Opportunities feature. Communication and social behavior. Anthropological linguists are interested in how language is related to a people's way of life. Their culture, cultural knowledge, and behavioral patterns. One topic is how language is used when people with different roles interact with one another. Even when our voices are silent, we send messages by body language and facial expressions, both of which are enormously important in conveying emotions and intentions. Also, language itself is only one of the ways people send messages to one another. We begin with this topic, nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication. People send and receive messages using more than just phonemes, morphemes, and sentences. Facial expressions allow people to read one another. We also routinely I'm so sorry. Routinely send both conscious, intentional, and unconscious implicit messages by how we move our bodies or parts of our bodies. Can Kinesics studies, I'm sorry, studies the role of body motions in communication. We also can convey feelings and other emotions and messages by touching one another. Some nonverbal nonverbal spatial, excuse me, facial expressions convey the same messages across all people, so presumably these are part of the Homo sapiens biological heritage. Pleasure, sadness, anger, puzzlement, and other, and some other emotional responses are shown by similar facial expressions everywhere and convey similar meanings universally. Notice, though, that people sometimes use facial expressions to de deceive as with phony smiles and fiend anger. Also frequently, a given a facial expression is normatively appropriate, like a smile in greeting someone. So the expression occurs regardless of the actual inter internal emotional state of the person. People also communicate nonverbally by using space here meaning how closely persons who are interacting position themselves when standing or sitting or walking. Proximix studies the meaning conveyed by space and distance. Edward Hall, who pioneered the field of proximix in the 1950s and 1960s, note, noted that in the United States, people communicate messages by how far apart they stand or sit while interacting. There is intimate distance up to 18 inches. Personal distance about two feet to four feet and social distance over four feet. The latter applying mainly to formal situations. Try violating these conven con conventions by standing a bit too close to an acquaintance. Just be sure to do so in an area where the person can move away from you. Distance can convey other kinds of social messages. It is usually offensive or a sign of aggression to get in someone's face, as illustrated by ballroom, quarrels, and player umpire altercations. Like speech, most forms of nonverbal communication are symbolic behaviors. A particular body notion 
motion or distance does not inherently convey a certain message, but does so only because of conventions or common understandings, because much nonverbal communication is arbitrary and conventional. There is great potential for misunderstanding when people do not share the same pause, same meanings for nonverbal messages. That is when people have learned different conventions. Probably the potential for misunderstanding is even greater with nonverbal messages than with spoken language. When two people from different cultures converse, but generally know that they do not understand the other's language. So at least each person is aware of his or her own ignorance. However, both are more likely to think they understand nonverbal messages. So they might give or take offense, which one none is intended. Miscommunication is especially likely with touching the unspoken rules for which vary greatly from people to people and even from individual to individual. On one Micronesian island, married, engaged, or romantically involved couples rarely walk hand in hand public. Although close friends of the same sex frequently do so, carrying no implication of sexual preference. Touching someone on the hand, including the North Americans, consider an affectionate rub or friendly pat is offensive. In Korea and Japan, women often affectionately walk holding hands or with their arms around each other. Some scholars who study nonverbal communication distinguish low touch and high touch cultures, such as dichotomies, are usually simplistic, but it is also it is true that cultures vary greatly in how they define situations in which touching is normatively desirable or appropriate. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> similar ideas apply to the use of space. Again, the possibilities of miscommunication are great when people with different cultural upbringings interact. Sometimes Middle Easterns. Easterners or Latin Americans stand too close for North Americans' comfort zone, simply becoming aware that cultural norms about body motion, touching, distance, and so forth differ. From people to people can help us all avoid taking offense when someone violates our norms about space. In a world where international migration, tourism, global global business and other forms of intercultural contact are exploding, awareness of such differences is both personally useful and socially valuable. Speech and social context. During intercultural relation, children learn how to communicate appropriately in given social, excuse me, social situations. Different situations require different verbal and nonverbal behavior. Because how a person speaks and acts varies according to whom the person is talking, who else is listening, and the overall situation in which interaction is occurring, much speech behavior is an aspect of the, the role a person takes on relative to other peoples, such as friends, bosses, children, siblings, and teachers. For example, when you want to make a good impression at a job or admissions, interview, what you say and how you say it matter a great deal. To speak appropriately, people must take the total context into account. First, they must know the various situations or social scenes or their culture, which are solemn, which are celebrations, which are formal versus informal, which are argumentative, and so on. Cultural knowledge includes knowing how to alter the ones alter one's total, including verbal. Behavior to those situations, second individuals must recognize the kinds of interactions they are expected to have with others with whom they have particular relationships, which is connected to their social roles. Should they act lovingly, jokingly, contemptuously, or respectfully and differenti differentially, towards someone else. <clears throat> These two elements, the particular culture 
defined situation and the specific individuals who are parties to the interaction make up social context of verbal and nonverbal behavior. The field of soci sociolinguist linguistics studies how speech behavior is affected by social context. Here's the vocabulary term. And then I'll go ahead and so you can read this at your leisure. This is never required for us, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do this just a... Okay. Terms of addresses address are a familiar example of how speech both reveals and reinforce the nature of social relationship. Whether to address someone by first name or a title like doctor or professor varies with social context. Higher ranking people are more likely to address lower ranking individuals by their first name or even by their last name use alone. Not only does the non reciprocal use of the addre of addresses address terms reflect social inequality but it also reminds people of each of it each time they speak spanish speakers have a similar understanding with polite address terms such as don or senora they also have to choose between two words for you the informal usted or the informal tu depending mainly on relative status. Speech style and habits depend on status and rank in other ways. For example, in the old days, the speech of women and men in North America differed more than it does today. As in the use of profanity and words like adorable and lovely, in modern times, there are fewer differences between the vocabularies of women and men largely as consequences of changing gender roles and expectations and the influence of popular media. Even today, though, some, some people make judgments about a stranger's class, background, or sexual orientation by how he or she speaks. Other cultures exhibit customs in speech behavior in which most English-speaking people are unfamiliar. Here are just three examples. In parts of Polynesia and Micronesia, Traditionally, commoners had to use special respect language when they were addressing members of the, no of the noble class. In some islands, the respect language had only a different speech style, but also different words. Often there were severe penalties for commoners who erred in addressing no a noble, including beatings or worse, if the offender was judged to have been intentionally disrespectful or challenging. In Korean and Japanese, complicated set of contextual speech norms called hornorifics governs the degree of formality and politeness of people, politeness people normally use to show respect to those of higher social position. For instance, verbs and personal pronouns have alternative forms that speakers ch must choose between in addressing others. Relative status in the main determinant of which form to use. In Japanese, one verb form is used when the speaker of higher status than the listener of another form when the two are roughly equal status and yet another when the speaker is, social, is a social inferior Today, to a large extent, knowing how to speak is a matter of politeness and decorum. But in traditional Korea and J Japan, honorific speech was socially and sometimes legally enforced. All societies have, have customs of ta taboo, meaning that some behavior is prohibited for religious reasons or because it is culturally regarded as immoral, improper, or offensive. There are linguistic taboos for also, for instance, the Yanomamo and of the Venezuelan rainforest have a custom known as name taboo. 
it is an insult to utter the name names of important people and dis, of deceased relatives in the presence of their living kinfolk. So the Yanamom, Yam, I'm so sorry. Yanamamo sometimes gives names like toenail of sloth or whisker of howler monkey to children so that when the person dies, people will not have to watch what they say so closely. Norms per partly explain why people's use of language varies with social context. You are not expected to act and speak the same way at a party as you do in church or at work. For instance, and you are in culture to know intuitively and unconsciously how to adjust your behavior to those different contexts. The choice of speech style, words and phrases <clears throat> is governed by more than just norms. However, people have personal goals and speaking in a certain way can help them get what they want in everyday life. We strive to present the image of ourselves that we want someone else to perceive. The opinions that employers, friends, lovers, and hoped for lovers, co-workers, roommates, and even parents have us depend partly on how we speak or use <clears throat> our use of certain words and avoidance of others. The degree of formality of our style, with whether we try to hide or to accentuate regional dialects and so forth. How we speak is an important part of what so social scientists call our presentation of self. It is part of how we try to control other people's opinion of us. Like other ways we present ourselves, including jewelry we wear, how we sit and walk, how we design our hair and or shave our head, where and what tattoos as we play uh, tattoos we place in our bodies, the way we speak is part of the way we tell others what kind of person of a person we are. Almost without knowing knowing it, we adjust our speech style, mannerisms, and body language to manage the impressions of others people have of us. Our cultural knowledge of these adjustments is most, mostly routine and uh, unusually and usually unconscious, except perhaps at events like job interviews or public speeches. The language of power. We noted earlier that language is powerful, allowing people to communicate complex messages precisely and efficiently. When used strategically, language is powerful in another sense to influence or persuade by controlling discourse. What is you, what is talked about and how it is discussed in the public arena, individuals and groups attempt to control opinions. Those who control the content of messages potentially control the inform, information available to other people because human emotional reactions, thought processes, and behavioral responses depend largely on information. Inform information language can be an instrument of power. Political speech obviously employs language of power. Professional consul consultants advise politicians on what and what not to say and how to say it to increase political advantage. Here are a few examples of language use in an attempt to control political discourse. On abortion, it is, is it murder or does a woman have the right to choose? And how much does this answer depend on whether human life begins at conception or somewhat later in pregnancy? On immigrants, you usually know how a politician feels by whether she says illegal immigrants or illegal aliens or undocumented workers. On inheritance taxes, the phrase death tax is used by politicians who oppose taxing the enormous estates of wealthy people while those who favor inheritance taxes speak of creating equal opportunities and leveling the playing field for the next generation. 
on gun control, those who oppose it speak of right to bear arms guaranteed by this Second Amendment. Others point to massacres such as ones in Aurora, Colorado, Newtown, Connecticut, and Orlando, Florida claiming the gun lobby bears potent partial responsibility. The Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution reads a well-regulated militia being necessary to the existence of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Yet gun control opponents do not quote the well-regulated phrase mentioning only the right shall be infringed. On gender identity in spring of 2016, there was, a there was conflict in North Carolina over which public restrooms transgender persons should use. The Obama administration proposed guidelines under which individuals should use the facilities of the, excuse me, of the gender with which they identified governments of states like Texas and Arkansas refused to follow the guidelines arguing that the gender on the, a person's birth certificate should be the sole determinant of restroom occupancy. Strategic use of speech happens to most intense, intensively during elections. Candidates and parties choose words that arouse positive emotions and attachments to themselves and their programs in the United States. Phrases like socialist tax and spend big government, national security, individual responsibility, and personal freedom resonate with most conservatives who say that increasing taxes on the wealthiest will kill, will be job killers. Liberal leaders favor working people, environmental protection, and universal health coverage. They speak of giant corporations with their fat cat CEOs. Climate change legislation is a job killer for some and a surefire job creator for others. Both parties use the phrase, the American people want, need, as often as possible, although in reality, few Americans want and need pr precisely the same things as the rest of Americans. Every leader uses phrases like strengthen the middle class, protect families, grow the economy, and jobs, jobs, jobs. In the 2016 U.S. presidential primary elections, mainstream Republican leaders were astonished when Donald Trump beat out established conservative candidates. A few of Trump's outrageous statements were about immigrants, rapists, and murderers. Foreign Muslims, they can't be allowed to come here, period. A female Fox journalist, blood coming out of her wherever. And some believed women in general. Free trade so favored by mainstream Republican, China's, China is killing us. American decline, we don't win anything anymore. And many others, Trump also seemed to know very little about international affairs. The Constitution had the legal system and even economics. He promised to make America great again, to build a great wall and make pay Mexico pay for it, to abolish Obamacare and replace it with something great. And meet with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. Despite such speeches, Trump became the Republican nominee. The same words and phrases that alienated party leaders won over citizens who believed their economic standing had been harmed by immigration who thought that the outsourcing of jobs and wage stagnation were caused mainly by free trade deals who felt that that Islamic extremists was the main national threat and who viewed themselves as victims of discrimination by companies and governments who gave special breaks to minorities to many voters donald trump tells tells it like it is Almost all Republican Party leaders declared they would never support Mr. Trump in March of 2016. Yet by early June, practically all of them did. Why are such words, phrases, slogans, and like, and the like so important to political campaigns? One answer is that the majority of voters do not understand most 
issues of their complexity of so candidates use language that appeals instead to their feelings and values. Another is that effective language use, the kind that arouses emotions, demonic, demonizes, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced, opponents calls to mind, cherished values, reassures about personal and family security calls on patriotic impulses and the like saves candidates from having to reveal details of what they actually will actually sh do should they be elected. Solving a large country's complicated problems is a tough job. Providing details of plans and policies is politically dangerous, but who can be against job creation and improved security and family values? Language and cultures. Another term, another interest of anthropological linguistics is how the culture uh, people shares a connected to the language they speak. The top, this topic can be technical. So in this, in this section, we focus on only two areas that might tie language and culture together. First, some parts of language reflect social relationships and the importance people culturally attach to different things or categories. Second, it is possible that language shapes a people's perception of reality and even their entire worldview. Language as a reflection of culture. Most anthropological field workers try to learn the language of the community in which they work. For one thing, speaking the local language facilitates interaction and may help create relationships of trust. In addition, field workers also know that learning the language helps them understand the culture because many as aspects of a people's language reflect their culture. For instance, a complex classification tends to be tends to develop around things that are especially important to a community. If people frequently communicate about objects, qualities, actions, or persons, they are likely to have many names or labels for them and to divide and subdivide them into many detailed categories. Occupational differences illustrate the point. A professional mechanic or carpenter identifies several or a I'm so sorry, a professional mechanic or carpenter identifies hundreds of different tools, whereas the Saturday afternoon home mechanic or handy spouse identifies only several dozen. Attorneys must master a complex vocabulary that other people sometimes call legalize, legalese. Numerous other examples could be cited, but there are no surprises here. What about differences between whole languages spoken by many spoken by members of different cultures? Similar ideas apply to understand them. The concept of semantic domain is useful. A semantic domain is a set of words that belongs to an inclusive class. For example, chair, table, ottoman, and china cabinet belong to the semantic domain of furniture. In a similar way, different languages vary in the semantic domains they identify in how finally they carve up these domains and in how they make distinctions between, the di between different members of a domain. For instance, tropical lowland peoples are not likely to have semantic domains like snow or ice in their narrative language, whereas some Arctic peoples have an elaborate vocabulary about snow and ice conditions. Furthermore, the degree to which some semantic domain has a multi-level multi hierarchical structure depends on the importance of the objects or actions in people's lives. Island, coastal, or riv riverine people dependent on fish are likely to have many categories and subcategories of aquatic life, fishing methods, <clears throat> and flood and tide stages. For instance, can we go beyond such fairly obvious statements? For some domains, we can 
some things or qualities seem natural, meaning that the elements in the semantic domain appear self-evident. Distinctions even seem inherent in the things themselves. We therefore expect that people everywhere construct these domains in similar ways. For instance, the wavelength and amount of light reflected from one object to determine its color in the sense color is inherent natural quality of a thing. Blue, green, and other colors represent colors result from different wavelengths, but not every language recognizes the same wavelengths with separate names for colors. Likewise, biological kinship is a natural relationship in the same sense, in the sense that who an infant's parents are determines are determines who will and will not be the, the baby's genetic relatives. Obviously, aunts and uncles are different kinds of relatives from parents, but not all parent peoples recognize such differences and make them culturally significant, which means that relatives is not entirely a natural semantic domain. Consider the relatives that English-speaking people call aunt, first cousin, and brother. An aunt is a sister of your mother or father. A first cousin is a child of any of your aunts and uncles, and a brother is a male child of your parents. These individuals are biologically related to you differently, so you naturally place them into a different categories and call them by different terms. But other distinctions are possible that you do not recognize as distinctions and that are not reflected in their kinship terms you use. Not all your aunts are related to you in the same way. Some are sisters of your mother. Others are sisters of your father. Why not recognize the difference by giving them each, of the, each their own term? Similarly, the, your first cousins could be subdivided into finer categories and given special terms such as terms meaning child or child of my father's sister, child of my mother's brother, and so on. And because we distinguish most categories of relatives by whether they are male or female, e.g. brother versus sister, aunt versus uncle, why don't we apply the sex distinction to uh, our cousins? How do we know that the way people, the way a people divide the domain of relatives into different categories is cultural rather than natural or strictly biological? Because different cultures divide the domain in different ways, people in many societies, for instance, call their mother's sister by one term and their father's sister by another term. It is also common for people to distinguish between the children of their father's sister and their father's brother. Calling the first by a term we translate as cousin and the second by the same term they use for their real brothers and sisters. Even stranger to English language speakers are people who call the daughters of their maternal uncles by the term mother, just like their real mother but not uh, the daughters of their paternal uncles for whom they use the term sister. These various ways of categorizing kin, by the way, are not random. Such labels are related to other aspects of a people's kinship system as discussed in chapter 10. Obviously, the way various peoples Divide the seemingly natural domain of biological relatives is not the same world over. We could provide other examples, but over, the overall point uh, is clear. A language reflects how the members of culture divide up the world by constructing various categories of reality out of natural properties of things and people. See chapter two. Here's the semantic domain the implications of this point are more important than you might think 
If a language has a word for something, an object, a kind of person, an emotion, a natural feature of the landscape, then those who know the language tend to think it is real. Giving something a label of predisposes us to think of it as a thing. These things are real in one sense. The word refers in something real that people perceive, but this reality might differ for someone who speaks a language that reflects a different culture. Language perception and worldview. Sorry. We have seen that many aspects of a language reflect the culture of the people who speak it. Could the converse also be true? Is it possible to, that knowing a given language predisposes its speakers to view the world in certain ways? Could the categories and rules of language condition people's perceptions of reality and perhaps even their worldview? Language could shape perceptions and worldviews, both by its vocabulary and by the way it leads to people leads people to communicate about subjects such as space and time. Any language's vocabulary assigns labels to only certain things, qualities, and actions. It is easily it is easy to see how this might encourage people to perceive the world selectively. For instance, as we grow up, we learn that some plants and tr are trees, so we come to think of tr a tree as single kind of thing. Although there are so many kinds of trees that there is no necessary reason to collapse all this arboreal variety into a single label, in such cases, language affects our cultural constructions of reality. Also, language might force people to communicate about time and space in a certain way. The words and rules of language could condition relationships between individuals and between people and nature, potentially linguistic constraints on the way people must speak to be understood by others can shape their views of what the world is like. The idea that language influences the perceptions and thought patterns of the, those who speak it and thus conditions of conditions their worldview is known as the sapper whorf hypothesis or the linguistic re relatively relativity hypothesis. After the two anthropological linguists who proposed it, one of the most widely quoted of all anthropological passages in Edward Sapir's statement originally written in 1929, language powerfully conditions all our thinking about social problems and processes. Human beings do not live in the objective world alone, nor alone in the world of social ant activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language, which has become the medium of expression for their society. The fact of matter is that the real world is to large extent unconsciously built up on the language of habits of the group, Sapir 1964. Sapir and Benjamin Worf believe that language influences the world view of its speakers. It does so in part by providing labels for certain kinds of phenomena, things, concepts, qualities, and actions, which different languages define accordingly, according to different criteria. Language thus makes some phenomena easier to think about than others. The attributes that define them as different from other things become more important than other attributes. These attributes provide a filler, a filter that biases our perce perceptions. In brief, the linguistic relatively, relativity hypothesis holds that people's perception, the perceptions, the verbal categories they use to think about reality and perhaps the entire worldview are related to the language they learned while growing up. 
the units of time sequence of the English language are good example are a good example seconds minutes hours days weeks months years decades centuries millennia of these only days months and years are in any sense natural meaning they are based on natural occurrences sunrises and sunsets moon phases annual cycles of the seasons even these natural occurrences do not correspond with the English language units of time. Days do not run from sunrise to sunrise, but begin at midnight. Months no longer reflect lunar phases. Years begin in January rather than solstices or equinoxes. Decades, centuries, and millennia are purely linguistic categories with no natural bias basis. Units used on watches, seconds, minutes, and hours are linguistic units as well. How much is our perception of time affected by such arbitrary divisions imposed on our minds by language? Do the units of our language inscribed on watches and calendars create our views of time? In the 1930s and 40s, Worf suggested that language does indeed condition a people's conception of time he noted that English encourages speakers to think about the about time using spatial metaphors. For example, we say a long time and a long distance, although time is not really long or short in the same sense as distance. Also, English speaking people talk about units of time using the same concepts with which they talk about numbers of objects. We say four days and four apples, although it is possible to see four objects at once, but not four units of time, days in this case. Finally, English-speaking people classify events by when they occurred, those that have happened, those that are happening, and those that will happen. Worf suggested that the Language of the Native American Hopi leads to them to think about time and events in different events differently, with no tenses equivalent to English past, present, and future, and no way express time in terms of spatial metaphors. Hopi speak of events as continuously unfolding rather than happening in so many days or weeks. Worf argued that the Hopi language led the Hopi people to different a different perception of the passage of time. Notice some implications of linguistic act relative, relativity. If true, it implies that unconsciously, the language community in which we happen to have born shapes our perception and thought processes. Therefore, the word is not directly perceptible through our ordinary senses because the categories of our language bias bias our interpretations of sensory inputs. If valid, then it is difficult to under, to, for anyone to know anything for sure following this reasoning. It would mean that objectively and perception and inter interpretation are partially an illusion because Individuals can perceive and interpret only with the concepts and patterns their language, language pro provides as we cover in chapter five. Some anthropologists use ideas like this to question the discoveries and theories of science itself. What shall we make of the superior wharf hypothesis? Certainly none of us as individuals cre creates the labels our language assigns to reality nor do we create the constraints our grammar places in the way we talk about time and space. Rather, we learn from our linguistic ancestors, and we must adhere to these language labels and rules if we are to be understood. Surely this necess necessity biases, biases our perception to some degree. The question is how much? More precisely, how important is language as opposed to other influences on perceptions and views of reality. 
For decades, the Sapurin warp hypothesis was not generally accepted, although most scholars were intrigued by the idea that language shapes thought. One reason for skepticism is that if language significantly shapes the way its speakers perceive and think about the world, then we would expect a people's perceptions and worldviews to change only at a rate roughly comparable to the rate at which their language changes. But worldviews typically change much more rapidly than language. In the past century, the ling English language has changed little compared with dramatic alter alteration in the worldview of most of its speakers, despite the enormous economic, political, and ideological changes that have swept Asia in the past several decades, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Hindi, Vietnamese, and other languages have changed little. <coughs> Excuse me. The fact that linguistic change or replacement is usually far slower than changes in worldview suggests that language in and worldview are not tightly integrated. Despite this and other weakness, weaknesses, recent empirical research has led to the reconsideration of the Sapir Whorf hypothesis. Researchers at Ma the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics have investigated how speakers of different languages talk about space and location. Here we simplify their complicated and technical findings. Consider how English speakers talk about space. Space can be relative to the location of speaker or hearer. For example, on my left or above you, we also talk about space using absolute locations, especially when we discuss long distances. For example, head north to get there or south of town. These cardinal directions do not depend on which way an individual is now facing. When we provide someone with directions, we often combine relative and absolute references for examples. Turn left on Main Street and go west for about two miles. Some other languages talk about spatial direction in different ways in Southern Mexico. There is a Mayan community who speak a language called Tzitzel. If I mispronounce, I'm sorry. In their language, the important spatial references are uphill and downhill. These are more like cardinal directions to them because the overall slope of the land is consistent and they are seldom on the other side of the mountaintop or ridge. Zitzel speakers describe movements in terms of ascending, descending, or going across. If an object is on the ground, a person might say it is uphill of us. They make no distinction between left and right, so a translation of the location of a house might be to the downhill of you. Apparently, the Zetzel language does not affect perceptions. When shown two mirror image photographs, Zetzel speak speakers usually say they are exactly the same. Also interestingly, is an Australian Aboriginal language called Gugu, Yimithir. It uses only absolute references comparable to English's cardinal directions. Thus, they may say, there's a fly on your northern knee, P. Brown. They have no equivalent to right, left, front, or behind. The gu a Gugu Yimithir warned a linguist who was filming him to look out for the big ant just north of your foot. If they ask you to move over so they can sit down, they might tell you to move westward when some older Gugu Yimithir was watch were watching TV with the screen facing south. They said that a man on the screen moving toward them was walking northward. Whether languages like Setzel or Gugu Yimithir cause or even predispose their speakers to perceive the world in certain ways is not proven, of course. However, the Gugu Yimithir 
seem always to know their directions even when they are unfamiliar in unfamiliar surroundings, suggesting that they are more attuned to four directions than other people from wherever you are reading this. Can you point to East? Recently, economist Keith Chen proposed pro provocative argument derived from the hypothesis that language shapes how people think and behavior th that results. This concern how a language constructs present, past, and future events by modifying or not modifying verbs. English and many other languages use modifiers to denote past and present tense. For example, you will go, you are going, you went. Other languages do not use such modifiers. Instead, using phrases that translate literally as you go next week, you go, you go yesterday. These languages also communicate past, present, and future, but don't modify the verb itself. To do so, Chinese language spoken by Chen's ancestors is a notable example of such language. language. Chen argues that language that use verb tense modifiers subtly lead, to, lead people to emphasize the difference between the present and the future in deciding whether or how much money to save. Languages like English and Spanish predispose people to value present income over the benefits of saving for the future. In contrast, people use whose languages use context rather, rather than verb modifiers to denote past, present, and future are not reminded of the difference between or difference in benefits gained from present and future. Chin argues overall, this leads their speakers to save more. In his TED Talk posted in February 2013, Chin stated his point concisely, the two kinds of language led people to think more or less about the future every time we speak. To investigate this idea, Chen looked at many society, societies from various continents. He chose societies that are similar in most socioeconomic characteristics, but that differ in whether their languages use tense modifiers. Similar socioeconomic characteristics should lead to predict smaller savings rates, but Chen found that savings rates vary significantly between societies that modify and those that do not modify verb forms. That is, language determines how much people save at less, least, as much as their economic conditions. Of course, an idea like Chen's is certainly is certain to be controversial, not only because its practical implications would be quite important, but also because it contradicts so much of what we think we know about econ economies. This is the end of chapter three.